go ahead and introduce you. Sorry. All right, everyone, looks like we can go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is Kirk Sigmund. I'm the president of the Cornell Federal Society, and I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Robert Levy. He has a PhD in business, and he was a valedictorian at George Mason Law. He clerked for both Judge Roy C. Lambert and D Judge Douglas H. Ginsburg uh, for the District Court in D.C. and the Court of Appeals in D.C., respectively. He was the former professor at law at Georgetown. He, was, he is now known as the chairman of the Cato Institute. He's the financier and co-counsel for DCV Heller. We'll be bringing another DCV Heller involved party, I believe, next month. And finally, he sits on the board of the Institute for Justice, the Federal Society, and George Mason Law. Mr. Uh, Levy has written many great uh, articles and books, one of them being the Dirty Dozen, in which he's actually written about the Commerce Clause in great detail. So he's a great person for us to have here at Cornell Law, and we're very proud to have him. So with no further ado, Mr. Robert Levy. Thanks uh, very much. It's good to be with you. I uh, actually went to law school when I was in my 50s, so uh, I may be the only, f the only federal clerk, uh, law clerk ever to have been older than both of the judges that he uh, clerked for. Was, uh, I clerked the first year for Royce Lamberth on the U.S. District Court, and I think I was about three years older than he was, and, uh, and then the next year for Doug Ginsburg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And I was three years older than uh, Judge Ginsburg. So the, the marshals who guard the uh, D.C. courthouse with great diligence uh, couldn't get it through their head, head that anybody as old as I was was a law clerk. So for two years it was always good morning, Your Honor, or, good morning, Judge Levy. And I, uh, <clears throat> of course, never disabused them of that, of that notion. It wasn't until I got up into the chambers that they told me to go fill the water jugs uh, like the rest of the clerks. It's a great experience. If you get a chance to, uh, to clerk, I highly recommend it. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, President Obama's most important piece of domestic uh, legislation, uh, PPACA, P-P-A-C-A, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which some have called Obamacare. Uh, it is likely to be reviewed by the Supreme Court. Cert petitions are pending. There is a split in the circuits. Uh, if it is reviewed by the Supreme Court, uh, we could have a decision by June 30th of uh, of 2012, and if we have a decision by June 30th of 2012, it is likely to be, um, or it could be at least, uh, one of the most important uh, cases in many, many decades. Uh, it will test whether there are any limits remaining on <clears throat> the exercise of federal power. The, the central issue is whether there's constitutional authorization uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, Congress to have enacted uh, PPACA, more specifically one particular part of uh, PPACA, which is the mandate uh, that says that uh, individuals have to re acquire prescribed life, uh, prescribed uh, health insurance or pay a penalty uh, for not doing so. Uh, and now the proponents of uh, uh, PPACA, or I may, I may say Obamacare sometime, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, uh, even though apparently the supporters of uh, uh, of the legislation have considered that the use of the term Obamacare is somehow a pejorative. Uh, but in any event, the, the proponents of Obamacare have cited uh, three uh, constitutional sources of authority, the taxing power, the commerce clause, and the necessary and pro proper clause. Those are the constitutional pedigree. So I want to talk about uh, each of those arguments. But before I do that, uh, what is this uh, individual mandate? Uh, and why did it, how and why did it come about? It's the centerpiece of uh, of Obamacare. It's, a, it's an unprecedented legal requirement that Americans purchase an approved policy under penal, penalty of law if they don't do so. And without the mandate, uh, said President Obama, uh, the rest of the legislation falls apart. Now why? Uh, because the major part of the legislation is to require insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions. Now this was an, an important and necessary because what's been happening is that People, almost everybody in this country gets their insurance through their employer. That's for complicated reasons uh, related to the tax code, which really ought to be redressed. But nonetheless, that's the way it is. So just about everybody gets their insurance through their employer. And what happens is they get sick, and then some, somehow they either lose their job or they quit, and they find themselves sick seeking another insurance policy. And insurance companies are not stupid. You don't insure a house if you look at it, and the fire's already started burning. In the same sense, you don't insure somebody who's got a pre-existing condition unless you charge them a hell of a lot of money. <clears throat> so Obama's solution to that problem is to require, 
demanded that the insurance companies cover pre-existing conditions and furthermore that they do so without charging any more money than they would to a person who did not have a pre-existing uh, condition. Now the insurance companies, as you might imagine, are not wild about I that idea and they know that they're going to lose a lot of money. Why? Because their customers are not stupid. If you know that the insurance company has to insure you uh, when you get sick, then if you're rational, you will not get an insurance policy until you get sick. Why in the world should you pay premiums while you're healthy if you know that when you get sick, the company has to cover you and can't charge you any more than they would have if they'd uh, issued the policy when you were healthy. So this waiting game with consumers not getting insurance means that the insurance companies are not going to collect premiums uh, from healthy people, which they absolutely have to have in order to pay benefits to people who get sick or injured. So that's problem number two, and Obama has a solution for that one as well. And that is we're not going to permit the people to wait. We're going to require them to buy um, health insurance. And if they don't do so, they're going to have to pay a penalty. Now, this uh, federal mandate to purchase a product from a private uh, company is untested in the courts. Uh, it was last proposed but never got to court in the context of Hillary Care. That was back in 1994. And at that time, the Congressional Budget Office had this to say about it, and I'm quoting. A mandate requiring all individuals to purchase health insurance would be an unprecedented form of federal action. The government has never required people to buy any good or service as a condition of lawful residence in the United States. Um, that, however, is precisely what PPOC is going to do unless the Supreme Court says otherwise. So what are the three arguments? And argument number one is a taxing power argument. Um, and Congress does have the power to lay and collect taxes to provide for the uh, general welfare of the United States. And the Supreme Court addressed this general welfare clause taxing power argument back in 1937 in a case called Helvering v. Davis. The issue in that case was uh, whether or not the Social Security system is constitutional. So you can see that that issue itself uh, has relevance to the current issue since uh, health care and Social Security are very much uh, related. That is it required for people to participate in a system that they might not otherwise voluntarily uh, participate. Uh, and by the way, the case back in 1937, uh, you know, if you want to know whether that case was a good case or bad case, you can't, you have to think like a judge. It's not whether Social Security is a good idea. It's not whether the system is actuarially sound. It's not whether guys like me, 70 years old, like to get their checks every month. It's whether or not there's any authority in the Constitution for the government to require people to fund their own uh, retirement. Uh, if you ask the proponents, and uh, they were asked back in 1937, uh, they said it's uh, authorized under the General Welfare Clause, the power to tax in order to promote the general welfare. This became a battle between Hamilton and Madison. Uh, Hamilton said the General Welfare Clause, the power to tax, is an extra added power of Congress over and above the other powers that are enumerated, mostly in Article 1, Section 8. There are 18 powers that are enumerated there. Over and above that, said Ma uh, Hamilton, in addition to those 18, there is the power to tax in order to provide for the general welfare. Madison said that can't be the case. If that's the case, then we have, since everything can be characterized as providing for the general welfare, uh, we have a government of unbounded powers and we know that the intent of the framers was to provide a government of limited and enumerated uh, powers. So Madison even went a step further. He said not only isn't it an extra added power, but the general welfare clause is actually a restraint on government's exercise of power. What Madison said that the clause meant was this that government can exercise the powers that are laid out in the Constitution. And even if it limits itself to those particular powers, those enumerated powers, government has to jump through one more hoop. It can only exercise even that limited list of powers in a manner that provides for the general welfare and not the welfare of what Madison called factions and what we today call uh, the special interests. Well, when the court looked at this in the Helvering v. Davis case, uh, basically the court said Hamilton wins, Madison loses. And that opened up uh, the floodgates. Social Security was deemed to be constitutional. Um, uh, and now we have a system whereby, uh, um, a redistributive system whereby uh, funds are taken from, taken from some people to, uh, to fund other people, to subsidize other people without any uh, constitutional constraints uh, whatsoever. Now, even though we have this adverse uh, precedent that says that the taxing power is very broad, uh, the general welfare clause is very broad. Uh, 
Only one of the eight federal courts that have ruled on Obamacare, both district and appellate courts, have embraced uh, this taxing power logic. Uh, they've recognized that the purpose of a tax is to generate revenue. That's why taxes are imposed. But by contrast, the insurance mandate doesn't exist to generate revenue at all. As a matter of fact, it worth, if it works perfectly, it will generate exactly zero in revenue. The whole idea of the insurance mandate is to coerce people into obtaining health care coverage. Um, the assessment is not a tax. It is a penalty. And if you think about that, I mean, only legal acts can be taxed. For example, the purchase of cigarettes. You can tax the purchase of cigarettes. It's legal to do so. If Congress makes something illegal, like the purchase of heroin, uh, or uh, the purchase of, uh, of the non-purchase of, uh, of, of health insurance, uh, government's recourse is not to tax it. You don't tax heroin. You have to punish it. And so this, indeed, is a penalty and uh, not, uh, not a tax. And the Florida judge who decided the case that this and it said that Obamacare is unconstitutional, uh, agreed with that. He pointed out that Congress had written tax in an earlier version of the legislation, but then changed the word to penalty in the, uh, in the final version. And tax is used elsewhere in the bill um, to describe other sources of revenue. So the, the drafters of the legislation knew very well how to specify a tax when that's what they meant. And if you ask the drafters of Obamacare where, what is their constitutional source, they say and said in the legislation, our source is the Commerce Clause, not the taxing power. Apparently, Congress did not want the kind of scrutiny uh, that attaches to a multi-billion dollar uh, tax uh, increase, especially after Obama had repeatedly uh, called the assessment a penalty and reminded voters over and over again uh, of his promise not to impose any new taxes on the middle class, but that's what this would be if indeed it were uh, a tax. Well, assume that the court, uh, even though seven of eight courses have said it's not a tax, assume that the Supreme Court disagrees and does find that the penalty for not purchasing health insurance is indeed a tax. Is it a constitutional tax? Uh, I would suggest that it isn't. Uh, taxes are of three types. They're either income taxes, excise taxes, or direct taxes, and each of those taxes have to meet a certain uh, specified uh, constitutional constraint. Uh, and the mandate under Obamacare doesn't satisfy any of those, and so it's not really a valid tax. Uh, income taxes, as you know, are authorized uh, by the 16th Amendment. And the, the key, uh, which is obvious by the definition, is that uh, income taxes have to be triggered by income. But the penalty under this mandate is not triggered by income, it's triggered by not purchasing health insurance. Uh, and the only thing that's related to income is that there's an exemption for people who don't have a certain level of income. But the amount of the penalty depends on your age, your family size, your geographic location, and whether you smoke. Those are the determinants of the, of the tax. So the penalty is quite clearly not an income tax. What about an excise tax? Excise taxes, like gasoline taxes, they're imposed on transactions. Now, this is actually a, pen a penalty imposed on a non-transaction that is not buying something. So maybe it's like a reverse excise tax. But excise taxes, if you look at the Constitution, they have to be uniform across the country. They can't vary uh, by geography. And yet, the penalty does vary. One of the determinants of the size of the penalty is location. So it can't be a constitutional excise tax. What about a direct tax? Uh, direct taxes are like real estate taxes or poll taxes, which we used to have. Taxes on property or, or persons. Um, well, the, the penalty is on non-ownership of property. Uh, so maybe it's sort of a reverse uh, direct tax. It's not on ownership of property, it's on non-ownership of property. Uh, but if you look at the Constitution again, direct taxes have to be apportioned among the states according to population. Uh, so, and, and this is not. Uh, this has nothing to do with population of each state. So the mandate uh, is assessed on individuals, not on states in accordance with their population. So plainly put, uh, the mandate can't be justified, in my view, under Congress's power to lay and collect taxes to provide for the general welfare of the United States. Uh, and so that leads to the President's uh, second assertive source of constitutional power, and that is uh, to regulate commerce among the several states, the Commerce Clause. Uh, the threshold question, of course, is whether Congress's power to regulate uh, interstate commerce can extend to behaviors that are not interstate and not commerce. And if no seems like a self-evident answer, uh, you just haven't paying, been paying attention uh, to the Supreme Court over the last uh, seven decades. And if you've had uh, con law, I'm sure you've studied Wicker v. Filburn, the key 
uh, Commerce Clause case from 1942, which laid the uh, groundwork for this vastly expanded uh, regulatory state. Uh, you may recall, Filburn grew wheat on his own farm. He didn't buy the stuff, he grew it. And he didn't sell any of it interstate. The, for the most part, he ate all of it or gave it to his farm animals. Uh, Roosevelt decided the price of wheat and other agricultural crops during the Great Depression was depressed. So he wants to raise the price. Econ 101, how do you raise the price? You reduce the supply. And so the administration, the Roosevelt administration, tells Philburn, you can't produce so much. And Philburn says, under what authority do you tell me I can't produce so much? And the administration says, we're regulating interstate commerce. Uh, Philburn replies, well, guess what? It's not commerce. Uh, it's not interstate. It's all on my farm all within one state. And it's not commerce because I'm not buying the stuff, I'm growing it, I'm not selling it, I'm eating it. Uh, the Supreme Court basically said, Philburn, you just don't get it. Uh, if you weren't out there growing this stuff, you would have had to buy it. And if you weren't eating everything you grew, you would have had some left over to sell. So by not buying and not selling, quite clearly you're having an impact on the supply and demand for wheat. And when you consider all the other folks that are probably doing the same thing as you're doing in the aggregate, that's likely to have a substantial impact on uh, interstate commerce. So this opened the second set of floodgates. The, the uh, general welfare clause case was the redistributive state. Now this opened the floodgates for the regulatory state, uh, regulating anything and everything uh, under the rubric of the, uh, of the commerce clause. So I, I think it's instructive to define a couple of terms. Uh, the first one, the obvious one, is commerce. The, commerce is the exchange of, of, of products, buying and selling uh, products. A, a different term, a much broader term, is the term an economic act. It, it includes not just buying and selling, uh, but it also includes growing, like in Wicker v. Filburn, uh, mining, manufacturing, distributing, and even consuming, like in Wicker v. Filburn. Uh, so here's the question the court is going to have to face in the Obamacare case. Uh, can the power to regulate commerce, commerce, that's what the Commerce Clause is about, conceivably cover an event which not only is not commerce, it's not even economic. It's an event that doesn't involve growing or mining or manufacturing or buying or selling or distributing or consuming. Uh, it took the Supreme Court more than a half century to flesh that, uh, that out. And, and there was a case in 1995 that you may have studied, United States v. Lopez, where the court held that the Commerce Clause does not empower uh, the federal government to criminalize the possession of a gun uh, near a school. Well, the possession of a gun is clearly a non-economic act. So that case, together with Wickard v. Filbert, yields this modern framework uh, for interpreting the Commerce Clause. It's a broad framework indeed, but not broad enough for Obamacare. Here's the framework. Congress can certainly regulate commerce, which is the exchange of products, in this case, of course, since it's interstate commerce, across state lines. And naturally the transportation linked to that commerce. Congress can also regulate non-commercial economic acts, as in Wicker v. Filburn, growing and eating, if they have a substantial aggregate effect on interstate commerce. And that's what the court determined in Wicker v. Filburn, that growing and eating of crops did have a substantial aggregate effect on commerce. But, according with Lopez, Congress may not regulate non-economic acts such as the mere possession of a gun uh, within a certain distance uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a school. So that's where we stand today. And within that framework, uh, the federal commerce power is, is pretty broad. But the individual mandate in PIPACA uh, stretches even further than that. Uh, it dictates not just how, when, and under what conditions a product can be produced, distributed, exchanged, uh, or consumed. The mandate goes beyond uh, commerce. It goes beyond economic acts. It even goes beyond acts to regulate things that are not acts. Uh, the mandate actually compels that a transaction occur. Uh, so rather than uh, merely regulating an economic act that affects interstate commerce, PPOC commands the purchase of a product, health insurance, which, as you may know, cannot legally be purchased across state lines. It is illegal to buy health insurance interstate. So there is no interstate market to be regulated. And yet that's what PPOC uh, is proposing to regulate. This is bootstrapping, regulatory bootstrapping of the worst sort. 
First, Congress forces somebody to engage in commerce, and then it proclaims that the act uh, can be regulated under the Commerce Clause, because indeed they have engaged in commerce. Well, if Congress can do that, it can do pretty much whatever it wishes. Um, if Congress can regulate Filburn's wheat production, in my view, even though the Supreme Court has said that Congress can, in my view, that does not mean, that does not extend uh, to permit Congress to require consumers to purchase bread uh, from their local grocer in order to subsidize wheat growers. Uh, at least it doesn't extend that far for now. The Supreme Court's uh, tortured Commerce Clause jurisprudence uh, doesn't, doesn't reach uh, that far. Uh, in, in Judge Vincent's words, uh, again, the district judge who considered Obamacare determined it was unconstitutional, quote, courts have never extended Commerce Clause power to compel an individual to involuntarily enter the stream of commerce by purchasing a commodity in the private market. So the litmus test here should be economic activity. A mental decision not to buy something is not a physical economic act. In that, in that respect, it's no different than if you were to decide not to work. Um, that decision not to work, or the decision not to buy health insurance, <clears throat> can't be regulated. And yet the government argues that because this non-act, if it were converted into an act, might affect interstate commerce, that it can be regulated. Uh, judge Hudson, another district judge who said Obamacare was unconstitutional, put it this way. Quote, the subject matter must be economic in nature, it must affect interstate commerce, and it must involve activity. So thought processes, at least so far, are not subject to uh, regulation. Um, defenders of Obamacare respond that, hey, haven't, uh, haven't the courts upheld other federal mandates? For example, what about jury duty? What about the military draft? Uh, that's true. Jury duty and the military draft have both been uh, upheld. but. Uh, those mandates are authorized under other specific constitutional uh, provisions. The Sixth and Seventh Amendments guarantee jury trials, uh, so obviously that implies a power to select jurors. Uh, Article One, Section 8 expressly empowers Congress to raise and support armies, and so that's the draft power. So when necessary, the framers knew very well uh, how to provide an express power that was independent uh, of the Commerce Clause. Uh, what about state mandates, for example, such as uh, you have to buy car insurance? Well, a couple of differences. First, the states exercise police powers, you know, and they're not subject to the constraints on federal authority uh, in the U.S. Uh, Constitution. Uh, second, uh, mandatory car insurance is not designed to protect you. It's designed to protect third parties. That's why you have to have liability insurance. It protects their property and their person. You are not required to have collision insurance or comprehensive insurance. I don't have it on my car. So if you want to self-insure for damage to yourself, you can do so. Um, <clears throat> it's designed to protect innocent third parties like other drivers and pedestrians. Um, PPOC, of course, uh, directs individuals to acquire insurance on their own health, uh, unrelated to protecting third party rights. Uh, third, cars are driven on public roads. Uh, so the government has some authority, of course, to dictate the conditions for the use of those uh, roads. Uh, and uh, fourth, uh, non-drivers, they don't have to buy car insurance, obviously. Uh, so driving is a voluntary activity. It has associated responsibilities. Uh, the insurance mandate is not voluntary, and it's imposed on everybody. Um, now, there's, a, there's another argument that, uh, <clears throat> again, a Commerce Clause argument, <clears throat> that even if the mandate, uh, considered in isolation, doesn't regulate economic activity, uh, supporters of Obamacare that uh, contend that requiring this kind of health insurance is no different than requiring the advance purchase of health care. So if you buy insurance now, it's just as if you're paying in advance for health care. And since nearly everybody ultimately consumes health care, and consumption, we know from Rick and V. Filburn, is clearly an economic act. So why then, so the argument goes, wouldn't the Commerce Clause uh, allow the federal government to direct that health care be purchased now by obtaining insurance uh, rather than later when the medical bill uh, comes due? In other words, buying health insurance uh, by the terms of this argument is just a timing decision. It's about when and not whether. Uh, to incur uh, medical costs. Well, Judge Vincent in Florida was not convinced. He should not have been convinced. 
Half of all Americans, as you may know, uh, use virtually no health care until they're 65, and at that point they're covered by Medicare, and so none of this applies uh, in, in any event. But I think, more importantly, all insurance represents a timing decision. So you pay up front, for example, if you have insurance for burial, uh, for life insurance, loss of life, for disability, uh, for default on your mortgage, uh, and on and on and on. Only a federal government of really unlimited powers could mandate that every American had to insure against those kinds of risks. Um, and government cannot compel the advanced purchase of other things that are every bit as necessary as health care. What about can government make you buy your food in advance or buy your clothing in advance or buy your shelter in advance? Uh, if whether to buy exceeds Congress's commerce power, then uh, when to buy exceeds it as well. Um, and you know that Obamacare doesn't just mandate coverage. It also prescribes certain provisions that each policy has to include. So it's not just that you have to be covered. It tells you how you have to be uh, covered. And many Americans who prefer uh, to insure using, for example, health savings accounts uh, with high deductible are told by our federal overseers uh, that uh, such coverage is not going to be adequate. It is impermissible. So never has the Commerce Clause been stretched to those kind of lengths, and never could the framers, I think, have envisioned this kind of overweening uh, federal power. And so that's why the supporters of Obamacare had to have yet another uh, fallback position, and it is the necessary and proper clause. Uh, the administration argues that the Constitution authorizes implicit powers under Article 1, Section 8, which says Congress can, quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution its other legitimate powers. So if government could show that the insurance mandate is both necessary uh, and proper um, for Congress to regulate the health care market, uh, the courts are, so the argument goes, unlikely to intervene. Now note that the government's uh, argument is still premised on Commerce Clause authority, but over health care, not health insurance. Forcing Americans to purchase an insurance product that they don't want uh, is ostensibly permissible, if you believe this argument, but only because the mandate is a necessary and proper means of regulating the national health care system. And that uh, assertion is the corollary of two other uh, underlying arguments, and I think both of them are flawed. First, the mandate is said to be necessary because its elimination would perpetuate this problem we have of the uninsured. That is, taxpayers continue to bear the burden of people who show up at the emergency window uh, and they get uh, emergency care and they don't have insurance and so taxpayers foot the bill. Uh, without, that, uh, without the mandate, uh, responsible insured consumers would have to pay uh, the costs of irresponsible and uninsured uh, consumers. But this, this cost shifting by the uninsured is not inevitable. First of all, understand that it only arises because we, by law, have compelled doctors and hospitals to serve uh, all comers. If we didn't do that, uh, this uh, issue wouldn't arise at all. Furthermore, the cost only arises if a person gets sick, if he seeks medical care, if he can't pay, if he has no access to funds from his family uh, or his friends or from private charities. And those costs, limited as they are, uh, can be more efficiently addressed if they occur and when they occur. We don't have to tax or penalize everybody in order to cover this very minor amount of costs. And paradoxically, the people that are most likely to burden taxpayers with this kind of cost, people with low income, who cannot afford an insurance, cannot afford to pay for their health care, show up in the emergency windows, those people are not covered by Obamacare at all because Obamacare has an income threshold and they are exempt from the mandate. And if they're really poor, they are covered by Medicaid. <clears throat> and by the way, uncompensated care in the United States, it's a serious problem. It's about $50 billion a year, but we spend $2.4 trillion a year in health care. So we're talking about 2.2% of our health care expenditures uh, for uncompensated uh, um, medical care. And the mandate doesn't eliminate that cost. All it does is transfers the cost to the insurance companies. And the insurance companies recoup their outlays 
by selling these mandated policies to folks like us who may prefer uh, not to own those policies. And it, as a matter of fact, the worst part of this is that total health care costs are going to increase, not decrease. They're going to increase with more and more people being insured. That's the moral hazard predicament that insurance industry has recognized forever and ever. Insured persons will demand more medical services than persons who have to pay their own way. And higher demand means higher <clears throat> higher prices. It's no accident that the cost of LASIK surgery and cosmetic surgery has gone down like this. The cost of MRIs has exploded. Because LASIK and cosmetic surgery is not covered by insurance, MRIs are covered by insurance. The mandate is going to make matters worse. Uh, it's not only unnecessary, it's actually uh, undesirable. Now it's true that non-purchasers of health insurance do sometimes impose costs on others. But you know, non-purchasers of a lot of things impose costs on others. Uh, for example, and some of them are health related. So if somebody doesn't buy nutritional foods, that could impose costs on me if he's covered by Medicare or Medicaid when he gets uh, uh, obesity related illnesses. Or if he doesn't buy uh, enough exercise gear. Or if he doesn't go often enough to the doctor for preventive uh, uh, medicine. So does the government also claim authority under the necessary and proper clause uh, to coerce the purchases of, the, of those kinds of products? Uh, if so, why do we stop with health care? What about defaults on credit cards or defaults on mortgages? Uh, they cause interest rates to go up for everybody. So can government compel that we all get credit card insurance uh, or mortgage uh, insurance? Um, the second rationale for this necessary and proper clause I think is, is no more convincing and that is that, uh, uh, that it's, it's, a, it's necessary for everybody to be covered for, because uh, um, of the pre-existing condition problem. Uh, the insurance mandate gives the insurance companies a subsidy. They sell policies that they wouldn't have otherwise sold. They can take those funds and they use them to be able to afford to cover uh, pre-existing uh, conditions. Uh, now, what do we really mean by necessary uh, when we talk about necessary to cover pre-existing conditions? Well, the administration relies, of course, on McCulloch v. Maryland, which you've probably studied uh, in con law, and Chief Justice Marshall said it's really not necessary, doesn't really mean necessary. Ordinarily, we think of necessary as meaning required or needed or essential, but he broadened it to include all means that are plainly adapted to achieving some designated objective. And applying that uh, pretty expansive standard, Congress decides that compulsory health insurance is a plainly adapted means to facilitate coverage of these pre-existing conditions. Uh, so uh, HHS tells us the mandate may not be in indispensable, but it certainly is plainly adapted. And once again, the judge in Florida uh, saw through this. Uh, the mandate, he said, is artificially necessary. It's required only because Congress went down a particular path that left a few, if any, alternatives. It's Congress that's requiring the insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions. That's why the mandate becomes necessary, because of the statute itself. So this is what Vincent wrote. The individual mandate is actually being used as a means to avoid the adverse consequences of PPOC, and that is the compulsory coverage of pre-existing conditions. He goes on to say, the more dysfunctional the results of the statute, um, the more essential or necessary this statutory fix. Under such a rationale, the more harm the statute does, the more power Congress can assume for itself under the necessary and, uh, and proper clause. <clears throat> By the way, there is another term in the necessary and proper clause, and that term is proper. What's it mean? There's very little scholarship in this area, uh, but uh, Chief Justice Marshall again set the standard in McCullough. He said, a regulation is proper if it does not violate established rights and is consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution. So notwithstanding the dearth of scholarship on, on this topic, uh, I think Judge Vincent in Florida had no trouble applying Marshall's uh, guidepost. The individual mandate cannot be reconciled with the limited government of enumerated powers. And so by definition, uh, it can't be uh, proper. So put all this together and what should Congress have done? Uh, to alleviate these problems of uh, uninsured consumers, covers of pre-existing conditions. Um, well, there were a number of options suggested. They were all rejected. First, you could expedite competition by allowing interstate sales of health insurance, which are now uh, illegal. Second, you could encourage the states to reform their medical malpractice laws, which are driving up uh, health care costs. And I, I should add here that I'm not in favor of medical malpractice being reformed by the U.S. Congress, even though conservatives 
are very insistent that the U.S. Congress get involved in this area. This is a federalism issue for me. <clears throat> the U.S. Congress has no business getting involved in medical malpractice, which is typically an in-state patient suing an in-state doctor for an injury all which occurred in one state. So I don't know how that morphs into a regulation of interstate commerce. Any malpractice reform should be handled at the state level, but it should be handled. It is an idea that we, uh, we need to incorporate, but not by the U.S. Congress. Uh, third, we can eliminate the restrictions on these health savings accounts with high deductible coverage. And fourth and most important, we have to change the income tax treatment of health insurance premiums uh, that discriminates against individual policies and in favor of corporate policies. Now, I mentioned to you that almost everybody acquires their health insurance from their employers. Why? Because employers can deduct the premiums that they pay for your health insurance against their taxable income. Now, on the other hand, if you were to pay for your own health insurance, you could not deduct the premiums. And yet you don't have to report the employer's payment of premiums as part of your income. So there's a real tax advantage in getting your insurance through your employer, since he can deduct that as part of his cost. He only pays really about half as much as the quoted value, uh, as, as contrasted with getting it yourself, and you'd have to pay 100 cents uh, on the dollar. Well, what's that mean? It means that there's yet another wedge that's driven between the consumer of health care, we folks, and the suppliers of health care, doctors and hospitals. The first wedge is the insurance company. We don't pay for, for health care. The insurance company pays. And the second wedge is we don't even pay the insurance company. We don't pay for premiums. The corporation pays for premiums. And what's the result of that? Consumers very rarely monitor the quality or quantity of the health care. When they know they're insured, and not only are they insured, but they don't even have to pay the premiums, they will have more demand for health care than would otherwise be the case. Again, get back to LASIK surgery and, uh, and uh, MRIs, the contrast between those two products, LASIK surgery going down, MRIs going up. So this dual wedge being driven between the consumer of health care and the supplier of health care uh, causes excess demand for medical services. You want to get rid of the excess demand, give individuals a deductible premium, just like the corporations have, and that would eliminate the incentive to purchase policies through corporations. Each of us would then go out like we do in every other market, and we would negotiate with the suppliers and we would get a product that's tailored to our needs. We don't negotiate now with insurance companies because the corporation does it for us, and that's why we don't have coverage of pre-existing conditions. We do have coverage in other areas, for example, term insurance. We all know that we could get sick just when the term insurance policy is going to expire and when we very most need the term insurance on our life, the insurance company could cancel it. So what do we do? We negotiate for guaranteed renewable coverage. It's an everyday common feature of a term insurance policy. Why don't we have it in healthcare? Because we don't negotiate with insurance companies. We don't get tailored products. We get packaged products through our corporation that covers everybody. So by eliminating the corporation from this transaction, we drive consumers to monitor the quality and the quantity, not only of their health care, uh, but of their, uh, of their uh, health insurance. And then they would do what they do in just about every other market you can think of. They would shop around uh, for adequate and for fairly priced uh, service. So that, that's a market-based solution grounded on individual responsibility, and it would raise no constitutional concerns. Uh, by contrast, Obamacare is grounded on subsidies and dependence and compulsion. And, and more uh, significant and more to the point, this key provision, the mandate, I think, is uh, unconstitutional. Imagine that Obama goes to the food industry and he says, you know, obesity is a real big problem in the country's driving up health care costs. You guys are going to have to cut back on the sales of chocolate because that's really what's causing this problem. And the food industry says, well, you know, we make a lot of money on the sales of chocolate. And Obama's response is, don't worry about it. Just raise the price of selling and you'll recoup what you lose on chocolate. And of course, the rational response is, we're not selling a lot of celery at the existing price. <clears throat> so I doubt that we're going to sell a whole lot more if we raise the price. And imagine Obama responding to that by saying, don't worry about people not buying in celery at the inflated price. We're going to force them to buy. And if they don't buy the celery, we're going to charge them a, a penalty. So would this mandate to buy celery uh, or pay a penalty just a, as a means of subsidizing the food industry and so they can afford to cut the price of chocolate, just like the mandate for health insurance is a means of subsidizing the insurance companies so they can afford to cover pre-existing conditions, 
Uh, would this mandate to, to uh, buy celery be a, a legitimate regulation of interstate health care? Uh, well, not in my book. Uh, the current Supreme Court might disagree, but I'm not aware of any precedent that dictates the outcome, not even uh, Wickard v. Filburn. Uh, the individual mandate extends the dominion of the federal government uh, to virtually all manner of human conduct, including non-conduct. And uh, Obama will have legislated a new a quasi-crime. It's perhaps the only offense that I know of, the only one in our history. It can be committed solely by people with incomes above a certain threshold. Uh, Low-income people, again, who are the people most likely to show up at the emergency window and sock the taxpayer with their costs, uh, they're not subject to this. And even worse, the perpetrators of this new quasi-crime won't have done a thing wrong except not buying private health insurance that they don't want. Uh, this, this attempt uh, to punish a non-act uh, that harms nobody, I think, is an intolerable affront uh, to the Constitution, to liberty, and to personal autonomy, and you can't uh, decorate it by calling it health care reform. Um, at its core, this is what Judge Vin Hudson in the Virginia case wrote, quote, this dispute is about an individual's right to choose to participate. Uh, in Florida, the judge put it uh, this way, if Congress can penalize a passive individual for failing to engage in commerce, commerce, the enumeration of powers in the Constitution would have been in vain. So that about sums it up. So the story of uh, Peepaka uh, in a nutshell, um, <clears throat> first, the penalty for not buying health insurance is not a tax. Uh, second, even if it were a tax, it fails uh, the constitutional requirements for income taxes, for excise taxes, and for direct taxes. Um, next, the power to regulate interstate commerce should extend only to economic activities. Uh, does not permit Congress to compel the activities in order to be able to regulate them. And third, the mandate is not necessary. Uh, it simply circumvents problems that wouldn't exist if it weren't for the statute itself. And the mandate is not proper. It cannot be recognized, uh, reconciled with the framers' original notion of a <clears throat> government of uh, limited and enumerated powers. So, you know, I think when this case comes up, and it's going to, uh, our most fundamental first principles are at stake. Uh, we limit uh, government power so people can live their lives <clears throat> the way they want. Uh, so it's not just an academic exercise to map the uh, precise contours of the Commerce Clause uh, or even to vindicate our commitment to federalism. Uh, or, or judicial review. Uh, those, I think, are, are worthy uh, goals, but they're just means to achieve the, the ultimate goal, and that is to maximize human freedom. And that's uh, supposedly why we allow uh, our government uh, to exist. It would be nice if the Supreme Court restores some semblance uh, of constitutional government. Thanks very much. Happy to answer questions.